Welcome to the History Unplugged podcast, the unscripted show that celebrates unsung heroes, myth busts historical lies, and rediscovers the forgotten stories that changed our world. I'm your host, Scott Rank. One of the greatest sports scandals in American history involved the City College Beavers, a basketball team that in 1950 became the only team in history to win both the NIT and NCAA tournaments in the same year. The team was composed entirely of minority players, eight Jewish and four African Americans. This is only two years after Jackie Robinson integrated Major League Baseball. And Robinson himself gave an inspirational speech to the Beavers before their second tournament championship. They were able to defeat some of the most powerful and prestigious basketball teams in the country with all white players. And one team, the Wildcats of the University of Kentucky, refused to shake hands before the game with the black members of City College. But one year later, the team's stars were arrested for conspiring with gamblers to shave points. Across the country, overnight the players went from heroes to villains. Some were arrested, all members were banned from the NBA, and they were kicked out of college. Today, I'm speaking with Matthew Goodman, author of the new book, The City Game. Goodman spoke with many of the players who are still living, or for those who passed away, their family members and neighbors, and he argues that these players were actually caught in a much larger web of corruption that stretched across major social institutions, from New York City Hall to the police department and sports arenas, and even the university itself. When the gambling and bookkeeping syndicates that created the scandal were toppled, it resulted in the demotion of hundreds of New York City plainclothes police officers. So in this discussion, we look at this huge story, but there's also a lot of contemporary resonance, such as questions of whether or not NCAA players should be paid or not. And in an era when NCAA football and basketball coaches get paid more than a million dollars per year in salary, it creates a system that is absolutely rife with corruption. So I hope you enjoyed this discussion with Matthew Goodman. Matthew, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be with you. Well, I'm very fascinated to talk about this scandal from the mid-20th century. It sounds very far-reaching and influential, but something very few have heard about. And in order to get into this topic of this scandal with the City College Beavers, first of all, could you help me understand the world of collegiate basketball in the 1950s? And the idea I'm trying to run against is I imagine it as you know, small town farm towns that send their teams to the big leagues. And from what I know about the NBA, which today is a multi-billion dollar industry, it really wasn't until a recent history. And Michael Jordan, when he started his career, the Chicago Bulls stadium was run down. So I wouldn't have thought of this much gambling money in collegiate basketball at the time. So what was the world of collegiate basketball in this period? Sure. Well, you know, in New York, I mean, much of much, although not all, of the action of the book takes place in New York. New York was really, I would say, the center of the world of college basketball at the time. We're talking about 1949, 1950, early 50s. All of the postseason tournament games were played in the old Madison Square Garden in New York. You know, it was referred to as the mecca of college basketball. And the thing that was amazing about it is that the college game um, was really much bigger than the pro game, um, it, certainly in New York, but elsewhere around the country as well. You know, uh, City College, they would, go, they would come into the garden for uh, a college basketball doubleheader, and they would fill the garden. They get 18,000 fans. The New York Knicks uh, might be lucky to get seven or 8,000 fans to one of their games. Um, and, you know, when there was a college basketball doubleheader scheduled at the Garden, the Knicks got relegated downtown to the old 69th Regiment Armory. You know, the the college game was by far the much bigger game um, in town. Uh, and, in fact, the Garden promoter, Ned Irish, was heard to say that, you know, with the way that college basketball draws, the Knicks are just a tax write-off for me. Um, so it was really uh, a big deal. Um, and uh, while there was in no way the amount of money running through the game back then that there is now when you're talking about TV contracts worth billions of dollars, um, you had a lot of money bet. You had a lot of money bet on the games, and we can talk more about that, you know. But each one of those games um, at the Garden, uh, it was estimated that upwards of $300,000 was bet 
on each of those games um, at the Garden. A lot of it from inside the Garden itself. There was a tremendous amount of betting and bookmaking going on uh, inside the Garden. So uh, it was a it was a it was a pretty big industry back then. Well, then that makes a lot more sense of why there was so much scandal attached to City College. But let's look at their triumph first before we understand the significance of the fall. What was the nature of the City College Beavers victory? Why was it so noteworthy? Well, let's start with this. And the 1949-50 City College Beavers were the only team in history either before or since, to pull off the so-called Grand Slam, to win both the NIT and the NCAA tournaments in the same year. So that in itself was a really remarkable achievement. But what made it even more remarkable was that they were playing for City College, City College of New York, which was not one of the big athletic powerhouses of the time, places like Kentucky, University of Kentucky. It was a merit-based free college in New York that was known far more for academic excellence than for athletic achievements. <laughs> From 1943 to 1946, the football team didn't win a single game. Wow. Not only did it not win a single game, it didn't score a single point um, in the entire season of 1944. So, you know, that was pretty typical athletically at City College. But the basketball team was very, very good. And making it even more noteworthy, even more remarkable, was that this team comprised all Jewish and African-American players. Every single member of the team was either Jewish or African-American. It was 11 Jews and four African-Americans. The head coach was Jewish. The assistant coach was Jewish. And this, of course, is only two years after Jackie Robinson had integrated Major League Baseball. And at a time when the newly formed National Basketball Association included not a single black player, the NBA hadn't even integrated yet. But the City College team was entirely made up of minorities. And then when they won, you know, when they won the championship, you know, they seemed to represent so much of what New York City wanted to think of itself, uh, you know, racial harmony, civic virtue, the triumph of the outsider. They were celebrated from one end of the city to the other. You know, the newspapers called them our boys, our champs um, at city. You know, the, the classes were canceled for the first time in the history of City College. So there could be this tumultuous victory rally for the team. They were met on the steps of City Hall for a photo op with Mayor William O'Dwyer. They were they were absolute heroes. You know, Nat Holman, the legendary coach of the team, went you know, went on the Ed Sullivan show to talk about it. Uh the players were in in Life magazine, a full page photo in Life magazine. Uh they really were heroes, which is what made the ultimate fall from grace all the harder, all the tougher for that. So in New York, they were perceived as heroes. How are they understood nationally? Jackie Robinson was the first to integrate baseball. There was tremendous blowback when Hank Aaron threatened the home run record of Babe Ruth. There were hundreds of racially charged letters written to him to telling him not to do it. How were they perceived nationally? Was there more vitriol against these players? I would say that they were beloved by black and Jewish fans all around the country to begin with. You know, I was talking to somebody the other day, an older guy from Cleveland, who said that he was a kid and loved that team because he was Jewish. And to him, you know, they were heroes for these fans and for those at City College and so forth. You know, the idea that they were national champions, that they were part of the national conversation, that they were included in the national conversation, that they were, it wasn't just a college of, you know, immigrants and poor kids, but a college of champions was very, very meaningful. Um, you know, the idea that they would, that they were a team that would take on all comers from all parts of the country, um, you know, in many of which the idea of a team made up entirely of blacks and Jews would be greeted only with derision and contempt made it all the more special. And the fact that they had to defeat a number of segregated colleges to to win the championship, places like the University of Kentucky and North Carolina State um, made made that victory 
all the more special. So I, I you know, I would re- really focus much more on the sense of love and belonging and meaning that their victory was greeted with by many fans around the country. Well, yeah, I could see how this makes the scandal so notorious. So from what you can tell, what happens? Their players are eventually arrested, but are we fairly certain of what they did or didn't do in the scandal? We are. You know, there had been rumors of so-called point shaving in college basketball for a number of years. In 1945, a group of players from Brooklyn College were arrested for conspiring with gamblers. There had been an incident a year earlier with a player from George Washington University. You know, there had been rumors all through the following season, the season after the double championship of point shaving. You know, the idea that a player will take money from a gambler or gamblers, not to lose a game, but simply to win by less than the point spread, you know, the number of points by which a consortium of gamblers um, estimates that the team will win by. So, you know, if you're favored to win by 11, you can win by 10 or 9 or 8 and so forth. And so there had been these rumors um, all through the season. Um, And then near the end of the season, the players are returning home from a game in Philadelphia uh, against Temple University. And uh, they're on the train. And what they don't know is that also on the train that night are two New York City detectives uh, who inform their coach that uh, the players will be, four of the players will be arrested when the train arrives in New York City. And, you know, the team gets off the train in New York. It's this kind of cold, drizzly February night. Everybody is dressed in overcoats and trench, you know, and and fedoras. It's like a scene from an old film noir movie, you know, and they're met by other detectives and they're taken downtown and interrogated for hours. And they finally confess. Um, And in fact, they had uh, the top Uh, five players on that team, two from the previous season, had taken money uh, to shave points in three games during that season. They're uh, immediately thrown out of school. They they plead guilty. Um, Two of them go to jail, which is the first time that an athlete had gone to jail for conspiring with gamblers. Even the 1919 Black Sox had not gone to jail for what they did. They're banned from the NBA for life. And overnight, they go from heroes to villains. And for these young guys, they spend, many of whom I've spoken with, by the way, I I, I was privileged to speak with all of the surviving members of that team. And for those who have, who have died, I spoke with their, you know, their widows and their children and their friends and neighbors and so forth. You know, for those guys, the scandal was something that they had to live with for the rest of their lives. You know, they had to pay the consequences for the youthful decisions that they made when they were just 18 or 19 years old. What did they say about it? What were they thinking when they decided to enter into that? And for them, what was it like to experience that blowback? Right. That's a great question. As I discovered, and as I discuss at some length in my book, these guys all had different reasons for getting involved in this. You know, they were portrayed in the newspapers as kind of greedy, corrupt players, amoral players who were willing to sell out their their team and their fans for a buck. That's really not the case. It was really far more complicated than that. Some of them were more willing participants. Some of them were less willing participants. Some of them knew that this had been going on for a long time, and they were claiming it now as kind of their birthright. But, you know, for other guys, they did it. You know, one guy did it just because, he, as he said, he he wanted the other guys to like him. He felt a kind of peer pressure. One of them did it because he was going to give the money to his struggling parents who were not well off financially. One of the guys whom I write about at you know, some length, he's really kind of the hero of the book, a guy named Floyd Lane, he resisted it. He said no on two separate occasions. He did not want to do it until finally he kind of got worn down and he saw that all of the other members of the starting five were doing it. And so he agreed to do it. And he took the money, $3,000, which he wrapped in a handkerchief and he buried in a flower pot in his bedroom. And he never touched the money 
except for $110 that he used to buy his mother a washing machine for Christmas because she had never had a washing machine.